Next up, uh, I would like to welcome Matthew uh, T. Bell. He's uh, the Dean of the School of Arctic and Climate Studies in the Ted Stevens uh, Center for Arctic Security Studies. Welcome, Matthew. Great, thank you. Good afternoon while they're bringing up the slide. So a little bit about introduction. So uh, it's great to be back in Iceland. So I've been uh, a number of times to the country in, in sport of work that I do at the Ted Stevens Center, but also my prior work in the, in the Coast Guard. But this is my first uh, first visit to the, I'll call it high north in, our, in Iceland into Akari, but uh, reminds me of my hometown in Kodiak, Alaska. So lots of wind, lots of rain, lots of weather, and, and there's no bad weather, you just dress for it. So there's always bad clothing. Um, a, a little bit about my background. So I did 36 years active duty in the Coast Guard. Uh, so primarily a shipboard operator, uh, principally focused on search and rescue, law enforcement, uh, uh, humanitarian assistance and prevention actions in the North Pacific, Bering, Beaufort and Chukchi Seas on the Western United States and in Alaska. Uh, interactions with Russia, uh, China, Japan, Taiwan, uh, Saipan, mostly looking at, uh, at fisheries management in, in the high seas. Um, academically, I taught chemistry at the Coast Guard Academy for a number of years, also was responsible for the professional development of the cadets that were working through the Coast Guard Academy, and uh, have, uh, have a close proximity transit to Iceland a number of years back on the tall ship Eagle, so sailed to Square Rigger across the North Atlantic in March. I don't recommend that. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty violent, but uh, we ended up having to spend a week in Ireland as we had to take down one of the yard arms because we bent it uh, across in a, in a northern storm. Uh, so most of my approaches now uh, to, to security in the high north come from that lens, that background, and operating as a search and rescue expert, a fisheries management, fisheries enforcement in those, in those high seas. I transitioned to the Ted Stevens Center. Uh, so the Ted Stevens Center for Arctic Security is the newest of the regional centers to the DOD portfolio. Uh, stood up about two years ago, and I was I came on board as the dean for the School of Arctic and Climate Security Studies. And with that, I'll give you an introduction uh, to the Ted Stevens Center, a little bit about where our background is and, and what we've done in the past and, and, and how we came into fruition. So the Ted Stevens Center is the newest of the regional center. It's one of six. Uh, regional centers across the world that is focused on regional security from a Defense Department perspective. Uh, so we're the sixth uh, in Anchorage. It's the first one stood up by the United States in the last 20 years. Predominantly, the three out CONUS locations, so the Ted Stevens Center in Anchorage. The, uh, the more infamous, the first of the bunch, is the George C. Marshall Center that's in, in, in Garmisch, Germany, that focuses on European security. And then the Daniel K. Inoue Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Honolulu, Hawaii. And then the third, which is us, the Ted Stevens Center. And then there's three located, co-located at Fort McNair in Washington, D.C. And cooperatively, we focus on regional security across the world. The Ted Stevens Center is the first that goes cross boundaries, cross connected, um, focusing on Arctic security. So from a pan-Arctic perspective, our focus is from the Western Bering Sea, if you will, from, from the little Diomedes Islands, all the way across from Alaska to Canada to Greenland to Iceland to Norway to Sweden to Finland to those borders of Russia. Um, and as, as was already communicated earlier, 50% of that space is owned by Russia. The other 50% is by those Arctic nations that, uh, that focus on, on issues technically connected to NATO now with, with Sweden's you know, pending accession into NATO very, very quickly. Our overall objectives for the center at large that's charged by, by the secretary when he stood us up was to advance Arctic awareness across the, the, the Arctic. We look to advance those DOD Arctic priorities and how they relate to those operations in the high north. We also look to reinforce a rules-based order in the Arctic, which I thought was very well communicated as it reflects back to those governing bodies, Arctic Council, Arctic Coast Guard Forum, IMO, and, and there's a number, a host of those that talk about, try to articulate this governance strategy in the Arctic. And then, of course, address the impacts of climate change 
my opinion, the impacts of what climate does to those security practitioners on the ground. So how does that influence uh, Arctic security practices? But more importantly, we do this with and through our allies and partners across the entire region. We're the, the first Pacific Center that asks to do that across boundaries. Uh, so we're aligned to the Office of Secretary of Defense for policy, for hemispheric defense and hemispheric affairs, specifically Arctic and global resilience. And then we have, I'll call it an operational connection back to the NORTHCOM NORAD commander. Each of the, re the regional centers are directly connected to a combatant commander. The Marshall Center, of course, uh, European Command, and the, the Daniel K. Inouye Center is connected to the Indo PACOM. At the same time, we also have our funding allocated through the uh, Defense Security and Cooperation Agency, and that they allocate our budget and our administrative uh, oversight. As was mentioned before, the strategic documents that dictate what we do as a center, the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, and one that wasn't listed up there is the national strategy for the Arctic region. And this is a new strategy that the White House promulgated last year, but more importantly here in the last few months, they've just now implemented the national strategy for the Arctic region implementation plan. And, and that focuses to look at uh, the advancing U.S. security interests across the Arctic. Uh, we look, of course, second priority is to mitigate the impacts of climate change, uh, environmental protection, economic development across the region. And then we also look to, to, to cooperate and collaborate with those international allies and partners, but specific mention of the indigenous peoples that already occupy that circumpolar uh, north. The, the newest of this regional center, so it, our, our boss likes to articulate, uh, we are building while doing. You know, for those in the, in the aviation side of the house, it's kind of like building your airplane while trying to fly it. You know, and from my perspective in the maritime setting, you've already launched the boat, and now we've decided to put the hull plating uh, aboard. And so trying to, trying to do things and build the center out at the same time is a unique challenge for a center that hasn't been in creation for, for like I said, uh, in more than 20 years. We focus on those DOD Arctic priorities, not just from a U.S. interest, U.S. military perspective, but those government agencies that are focused on supporting work in and through the Arctic, and we work through those allies and partners on the uniform side of the house in, the, in, in our allies' nations, but also through the various institutions that are focused on, on Arctic. Uh, academic universities, military think tanks, uh, military war colleges across the Arctic allows us as a center to connect the right folks. So part of our charge is to build out a network of collaborative, like-minded folks that are focused on security uh, in this region. Our vision, of course, is to focus on and advance a network of not only military, but civilian like-minded efforts. So if you think about the, the research that goes on at the academic levels at most of those universities, how does that play into scientific support for not only uh, informing uh, the climate change, climate security in the Arctic, but also influences industry and technology and energy aspects, not only from a, an industrial perspective, but a civilian capacity, but also how that influences, you know, Defense Department charges. Our center looks to build strong and sustainable domestic and international connections. Um, part of our team, yes, we're focused in Anchorage, Alaska, so call it near the Arctic at 61 degrees north, but our connections reach far and wide. Obviously, I'm here today. We've got colleagues in uh, Tromso this week for the start of Arctic Frontiers. We've had our own group of folks here in Iceland a number of times for Arctic Circle Assembly. We had folks in Robomini talking about security in the high north, and I'll actually be in Stockholm in a couple of weeks to talk about uh, defense tabletop exercises that you can do uh, not only for defense of the Balkans, for the defense of the high north, but how is the interplay of Sweden and Finland now going to inter, inter, in fact, or impact uh, the evolution of NATO as those accessions uh, are realized. We also looked to develop three different aspects of the, of the center. The first of which that I'm in charge of is executive education for our Arctic practitioners. The second pillar is to build out a robust research and analysis uh, connection across the Arctic. And the third is to build a robust strategic engagement outreach division. 
that allows us to put on seminars and symposiums, host them in Anchorage, but also host them uh, across communities near and, and close to the Arctic. We have a North American Arctic Security Workshop that we took to Nuke Greenland last year in cooperation with the, with the Danish government and the Greenlandic government, as well as Canadians. Uh, but now we're taking that to Qualuit in, in Nunavut uh, later this year, but also hopes to build that robust connection of like-minded coastal communities in Iceland, across that North Atlantic Bridge, as, as far uh, east as to Norway. And then, of course, our motto is to be committed to innovation and excellence. There is no one entity that has the right tool and the right resources to address all the challenges in the Arctic. So that's going to require us to innovate, not just from a governmental perspective, but also from a private equity, from a private enterprise st standpoint. How do we collaborate with industry? How do we work with education? How do we work with government to advance those ish ish initiatives to keep the Arctic peaceful and prosperous? When I say building while doing, so this is what we've done in just the last year and a half. Um, and so part of that consists of bringing folks to the Arctic, exposing folks to the Arctic to talk about the challenges. And so when you say I've been to the Arctic, um, we have to be careful on how we define that. Because I can look to the backyard in Alaska, North American Arctic, and, and that viewpoint from Utkiavik or Barrow is very, very different than what that view is from here or what that view is from a populated uh, Nordic country like Norway or what that population or that view looks like from the borders of Finland and Russia. And so when we talk about that Arctic, we have to be very specific on how we define what the environmental uh, capacity is, what the environmental impacts are, what the people, what the population looks like, what's the industrial capabilities across that Arctic. When we talk about infrastructure, or lack thereof in some communities, that may not translate well to some audiences. As we look at the, the infrastructure in, in northern Alaska or even much of North America, that infrastructure is very small, it's isolated, um, it's difficult to get to, there's no uh, capacity for road or rail to get there, so you're either approaching it from the air or from the Maritimes. And that's usually extremely seasonable. You take that to a highly developed community in northern Norway, and you talk about those differences in the Arctic, and it, and, it, and it doesn't match point. Our job is to try to connect those across that enterprise. So bringing folks to a field exercise in, in northern Alaska or northern Canada, but at the same time, taking those military folks, those governmental leaders, those community leaders, and getting them to see those other communities on the rest of the Arctic helps expand the concepts and the understanding of where we could potentially take that, that innovation, where we could take those technological advances, where we have a chance to, to cooperate uh, across the board. From a center's perspective, it, it goes back to the cooperative nature. As far as I'm concerned, we are better as a team. We are better as, as a unified effort. To me, that comes back to the importance of NATO. But more importantly, if we go back to Senator Stevens and Senator Anyway, completely different opposite ends of the spectrum. So one highly acclaimed Republican, one highly acclaimed Democrat, completely different approaches to, to economic values, to societal values, to socioeconomic values, but they could come to, together and actually come to an agreement on a number of issues. They are the driving force behind what we think our center is about. And it's one thing to say, hey, we're going to do a seminar, or we're going to do an educational series, or we're going to do some research from a particular vantage point, but our job is to get all the vantage points around the table, um, supporting the education or supporting that research, because that diversity of thought, that diversity of opinion, helps manifest a greater understanding of what the actual challenges are. But more importantly, it drives to more thought out, well-defined, and probably better funded uh, 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 staffing and uh, funding. So. How does the Ted Stevens Center now influence uh, uh, security a, a abroad, if you will, from, from a, a locally isolated, I'll call it elementary school from, from Anchorage, Alaska? Part of that is, is we draw on a robust pool of adjunct faculty members. So the center itself is only about 40 people. So we have 30 people permanent and, a, and about 12 to 15 contractors. So those 40 folks 
have connection to an adjunct faculty list of almost 2,000 people that now have a like-minded interest in the Arctic, shared interest in the Arctic, and through their passion and through their connections, we draw them in to, to deliver seminars, to deliver our coursework, to participate in panels and a number of those international forums. And that allows us as the center to bring some like-minded folks to the table, but also to bring a diverse approach to the solution set that needs to be, that, that we need to have to get after a number of those, those challenges in, in the high north. And you, when you specifically look across the Arctic, we can talk about a rules-based order. I'm glad UNCLOS was mentioned, IMO, governing body, Arctic Council. Any one of those won't have the right or all the right tools or all the right answers to help us govern that entire space. So allowing us uh, an opportunity to bring in uh, an entire set of, of individuals with unique perspectives, unique background, unique experiences uh, to develop those, to, to meet those challenges on the way ahead. You know, so for instance, Arctic Council in the past has been highly successful at challenging some of the environmental impacts to the Arctic, uh, including some search and rescue, including some prevention capabilities. But when it started to talk about security or defense, it stops. So what's the avenue to have those conversations about security or defense in the Arctic as we look to the space as being more competitive? I, I won't say it's contested, but with increased activity, increased desires for the pursuits of, of minerals, uh, uh, oil and gas, perhaps uh, the, the marine affairs as, as most of those fish species, fish stocks, are actually migrating north to, to follow that colder water, that's gonna concentrate all those protein sources in a very small space. Bring all those assets together, that's gonna create competition, that's gonna create a rub. So what formats can we generate to have those conversations to keep that, that competition at its, at its best, to keep that competition friendly, to keep that competition uh, uh, peaceful, um, requires avenues like the, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, uh, the Arctic Security Forces Roundtable and the like that allows you to have those conversations with not only industry leaders, but with defense leaders and security professionals, security practitioners that operate in that space on a regular, on a, on a regular, uh, more informed basis. Um, it becomes a challenge uh, when you try to walk through that entire space and you, and you have one country, half of the Arctic now excluded from those conversations. That's, that's difficult. Um, Rightfully, I think so, because of the, the actions that Russia took to invade, invade Ukraine, there are, there are some accountability for that, and they are being held accountable, I'll, I'll call it, on the world stage, if you will. How long will that, that press forward? We're, what, two years into it now? What's the future look like? I, I mean, there's, there are a number of scholarly experts that, that have an opinion as to how long that's going to go. Some say very short. Well, that's what they said last year. Um, some say very long. Well, two years isn't long at all. So how much longer can we go? Well, that's that's a big question into the larger uh, uh, mechanics of understanding Russia, Russia dynamics and the thought processes from from Putin and and, and below. When you look at the land campaign in, in Ukraine, that's one aspects of it. But then the other components of the military that the Air Force side of the house and certainly their maritime assets um, are, are basically untouched. Um, so how does that influences or how does that influence Russia's dynamics in ensuring a peaceful and prosperous Arctic continues? Uh, so, so from my perspective, prior Coast Guard work, to me, there's, there's a dichotomy of two Russias. And, and part of that is, is in my operations in the Bering Sea, so I had a cooperative relationship with Russia. Um, so U.S. Coast Guard actions to Russia and FSB, so common patrol area, common boundary, so efforts like search and rescue, uh, law enforcement, fisheries enforcement, fisheries regulation, uh, sovereignty issues along that established, well-established maritime boundary line between those countries, uh, we could work through that. I had an operations center that I could call and talk to my counterpart and vice versa. So if we had a case come up, you know, a fishing vessel was on the wrong side of the line or appeared to be taking too much catch or cooperating with an international for, off, uh, for another ship doing an, uh, an illegal offload of that shipment, we could cooperate and talk side by side. Those conversations today are still going, but the important facts of that of, of in-person meetings, command center to command center interactions, one team going to another country, those have stopped. Well, how do we expect to advance 
you know, the search and rescue exercise or advance the next pollution exercise or advance the next cooperative joint patrol of this enforceable boundary between those two countries uh, doesn't exist today. However, they still maintain a rules-based order. They follow the, the, the international rules of transit through the maritime boundary line or through the international strait because that, that feeds that, that nearly 20% of their domestic product of moving product out of LNG or LNG out of Yamal south to Asian markets. So generating that money, that dollar, is important to them. So they're going to abide by those rules. Well, the same Russia is now, I'll call it antagonistic in the, in the North Atlantic, towards Finland, towards Russia, is, you know, invaded a sovereign country in Ukraine. That's the same Russia that is trying to be peaceful and mindful in, in the Bering Sea, asking you to, oh, well, let's ignore this over here. We're playing by the rules over here, yet, yet they won't over here. How do you, how do you cooperate? Um, with a country that is, I'll call it bipolar in that nature. Um, that, that effort falls, you know, tremendous weight upon administrations across the countries for, uh, to, you know, for the U.S. to our State Department, and, and that requires incredible efforts to engage in those conversations with a, with a country that seems to be going in, in two different directions at, at once. Um, I, I wish I could, you know, forecast what the end state looks like. Um, and and as, as I can, I think you started out, it's going to go one of two ways. It's going to go really bad for Ukraine or really bad for Russia. Either of those two outcomes is going to impact the world at large, whether that's from a human security perspective, whether that's food security, uh, maritime security, uh, uh, sovereignty issues across those host nations, or increasing those, you know, those chances of, of a larger miscalculation that now gets into you know, full-scale uh, you know, efforts, you know, war, conflict between other nations beyond Ukraine and the United States. So, or between Ukraine and, and Russia. So that's kind of gives you a, a, an operational perspective of how I approach what this, this space looks like uh, from a security perspective. And, and, and notice when I talk security perspective, defense doesn't even come up into the conversation when you talk about all those aspects of human security. You know, when, when you talk about, uh, uh, protection of, of coastal infrastructure, when you talk about the influence or the confines of, of what these dynamic weather systems are doing to, to coastal communities, when you talk about the, the impacts, whether that's severe flooding or significant drought in areas that were fairly stable for the past, past 50 years, or you talk about subsistence uh, obligations for not only those coastal communities, but how that infects those larger protein stocks um, uh, in, the northern, in the northern waters. I mean, look at the large distant water fishing fleets uh, that, that, are, that are imperiling, you know, countries like, like Africa and South America. How does that look or what does that look like when, when that same competition for those protein stocks now migrates to the higher, the higher north? All of those are security issues, will likely lead to defense issues if we don't address those up front. Uh, so with that, I think I'd like to offer it up to some questions and answers. I know I'm probably a little early, but I'd rather get to questions that you have for me, and, and I can provide you answers for those versus me just talking and talking and talking. Thank you, Matthew. Do we have any questions here? Box. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so. Thank you for, for your lecture. I want to start with you giving your experience and uh, uh, extensive experience from, from the U.S. Coast Guard. You mentioned uh, search and rescue um, and, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I want to ask you if you could elaborate a bit more on that, how could, how could um, uh, that develop this place into all the you know, increased activities in, in the Arctic um, from a military per perspective, but also, uh, you know, the, the civil traffic, the, the commercial traffic. And, and how could you, uh, how would you foresee, you know, us cooperating together yeah. and on, in, that, in, the, in, in that sector? Yeah, th thanks. It's a, it's a great question. Uh, so so from, my, from my Coast Guard background, Search and rescue comes from, from two aspects, um, prevention and response. So on prevention, 
is, is formated by, uh, by, by regulations, by inspections, by communications to not only the, the industrial applications that are out there, but the, civ the civil applications of operating on the, uh, uh, in the maritime environment, operating on the high seas. So those prevention efforts um, can, can technically be costly because the return on that investment is, is not ve measured very well. So, so if you go to, say, for instance, a fishing fleet, and, and you talk about in, in inspections of their survival gear or their survival equipment, um, well, that gets pretty costly to do that in every single community where there are, are, are commercial fishing vessels or even recreational fishing vessels. So to do that across the breadth, um, can be, besides the, the, the funding to get there, well, now you've got to train a workforce to be able to do that. Um, and, and most, uh, I'll call it budgetary systems, that preventive work, if you don't show an immediate return on it, is usually the first thing cut, which then leads to the response assets that now have to respond to a, to a fishing vessel, to a commercial vessel that is now in distress. Had they had the proper training, had they had the proper certifications, had they had the proper equipment on board, the, the response asset would, would technically never be, never be required. But as things come up, you must be prepared to respond uh, all the time. Well, how do you respond to all threats and all hazards with a small, with a small force? Well, that, that allows, that forces you to, 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 to manage the, the area through a response center. So on, on the U.S. side of the house, we have regional response centers, uh, regional search and rescue coordination centers that continue to monitor the area, track the traffic, watch the storms, watch those high peak seasons where there's lots of traffic. Um, you know, and as you equate this back to the Arctic, our, our, our activity here is only increasing. You know, that's commercial traffic through, through oil and gas shipping, industrial applications, uh, resource extraction, uh, both on, on the mineral side, but also the, uh, the fishery side. Uh, but then there's increase in, in um, ecotourism and cruise ships are, are, are filling that space up. If it's not being proactive and managed from a central location, it's difficult to place your assets where you think you're going to need them at, 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 to the most degree. Uh, part of that is a cooperative effort that's now going to be required by all those nations that operate in that area. So, so on the U.S. side, uh, regularly, U.S. Canadian Coast Guard work together regularly. U.S. Canadian Greenlandic Coast Guard work together regularly. Uh, I'd like to say that was the same from the U.S. to the Iceland Coast Guard. It's a distance. We're getting better at that. Uh, Coast Guard Cutter Healy was just here this past, past October on its way back from the Arctic. Well, that interaction, that cooperative exchange of, of best practices, uh, call it officer exchanges, but how to best operate in that region, in that zone, can be best communicated through one of the, through a, through a central location, through through a central facility. That becomes key on minimizing uh, the impacts of, of poor prevention or limited prevention, because you can't you can't as I said you can't be a, a affecting all hazards at all places at the same time. So so you establish that requirement in your response assets to to be able to preposition to get to the, the, the most extreme cases of, of loss of vessel, uh, uh, oil pollution, or, or contaminants in, in that region, but you can only do that cooperating across, across the boundaries. Um, especially when you end up with peak demands on, I'll call it being pulled in two directions. Um, uh, so we have cooperative agreements and arrangements with a number of countries that, that will do a joint boarding or a joint patrol with their ship, but at the same time, Will, will allow their officers to act on behalf of the U.S. Coast Guard for, for an inspection or for an investigation. That cooperative effort can only be accomplished by those, by those services working together through a, through a common operation center um, and efforts that can coordinate those not only in advance, but also do the follow-on actions. It's one thing to say, hey, we're going to coordinate those actions, but the, the fisheries enforcement or the boarding action or the search and rescue case then needs to be evaluated by all the parties to take those lessons learned to help influence what the next round of activity is. So those joint operations, that joint patrol becomes much more effective in the long term. Yeah, thanks. Great, great question. He's going to run all the way up there at the top. Yeah, I'm going to make sure. Anybody? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks for a very interesting lecture. Um, I've got a, a twofold question with regards to, firstly, Iceland's current role uh, in terms of search and rescue and the uh, NATO cooperation. 
How do you see it uh, as it is currently? And the, secondly, how do you see it uh, develop in view of uh, the increased threat to the Arctic flank of NATO? So, so relevancy, it's, it's, it's absolutely relevant. When, when you talk about the North Atlantic uh, bridge, that North Atlantic connection, you can walk from, from Canada to Greenland to Iceland to Norway. The, the importance of the North Atlantic maritime routes, whether that's for commercial traffic or military traffic, is key uh, to, to understanding that the maritime demands and needs uh, across that, that Atlantic. From an Arctic perspective, all that traffic is going north to the Arctic and has to return. Um, from a commercial aspect, that's continuing to develop. But from a military aspect, you can look at the, the strategic position for where the Russian assets are um, and want to come through the, 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 the NATO requirements to monitor, track, and, and follow those, and, and I'll call it keep accountable to those, is key upon what that communications looks like across the, the North Atlantic. That, that NATO alliance allows those communication, that communications to flow more readily, especially with Sweden and Finland now joining that those ranks, that's just going to be in a communications across that front. I mean, NATO is defensive in posture. Um, yes, Iceland doesn't have a standing military, but the information, the, the key of operating, the, the, the knowledge that they have in this region can, can only help influence that, that NATO domain awareness, if you will, with that, with that improved communications. Are the demands going to increase over time? A absolutely. Um, would, would there be a call for you know, further development in Iceland, I certainly could see that, but from a budgetary perspective, whether it's Iceland's budgets or the U.S. budget or NATO budget overall, we're, we're not going to get there. So how do we best cooperate to take advantage of, the, of, of that collaborative nature already inside NATO? So continue to do those joint operations, continue to do uh, the, the joint sharing of information. And so cooperate, not, not just in passing the information, but, but approach it from, from a whole of government perspective. So. When, when the next naval flotilla comes through, U.S. naval flotilla comes through, if they just pass by Iceland and not stop, interact, do some joint operations training with, with the Icelandic Coast Guard, that's a missed opportunity. If we don't work on the communications from ship to ship, and not ship the command center, but ship to ship, let the two captains talk, um, that's a missed opportunity. Uh, when we talk about transatlantic military flights, you know, whether it's, whether it's air refueling or, or military transport, if we're not stopping taking advantage of the resources that are here to get familiar with the territory, learn how to operate in this environment, they cancel my flight. I mean, this morning's flight at 7 a.m. was canceled yesterday at noon. That advance warning is, is tremendously valuable, not just for the civil sector, but for the military operators. But if they don't come and if they don't cooperate and, and, and joint operate, they'll never know that. And, and so to me, uh, Iceland is key to that, that transatlantic NATO bridge across the, uh, you know, across this small neck of water, if, if you will. Um, so that cooperative effort, I think, is only going to is only going to increase. As we kind of heard earlier, you know, the cooperative efforts on the air forces between Norway, Sweden, and Finland is is only improving. And under NATO, that's going to continue to improve. And now we'll incorporate, you know, fifth gen fighters into that cooperative effort. Well, what does that look like when they try to push to the west? Sorry, most of those folks, they get over water, and I mean, that kind of gets back to your question. What's that search and rescue capability? What's that recovery of those down pilots requirements? Uh, all of those pilots are saying, hey, I, I, I've got a really good solid aircraft, but if I got to eject, I want, I, want, I want to be able to get recovered and get returned. That's a cooperative effort you know, across the NATO spectrum, and that's going to continue to develop as there's more maritime aircraft, there's more uh, uh, ships coming through the region when there's that more competitive space. And, and, and I have to say, what, you know, you, you put those, those folks in the same airspace or in the same water space, mistakes happen, accidents happen. Well, how do, how do we best mitigate that? Well, that's going to require cooperation by the folks that already live there, that already work there. That kind of gets back to your how well can, can Iceland support, you know, those efforts of NATO. It's a really good question. You, you have to throw it. It's just not the same if you just pass it. <laughs> Thank you very much for the overview. I really appreciate it. Uh, I have a question concerning uh, indigenous people. You mentioned the three pillars the Ted Stevens Center is focusing, yeah. uh, and also the focus on the localities, on the inclusion of indigenous people. They are in the location, very much present. 
Uh, what is the role, and especially how do you involve this in your uh, uh, institute's uh, center strategy, but also the role in the national strategy yep. uh, in terms of founding and in terms of research? Yeah, so, so very Thank good you. question. And, and since the center stood up, um, indigenous people's perspective has been key to, to, to our values and, 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 and our efforts, to our mission. So on my staff, we have, you know, technically three folks that are, that are indigenous Alaska uh, and, and so not only share their personal experiences and, and their personal perspectives through their work, but they're already connected with that circumpolar indigenous population. So, so we have folks that we're already connected with through our indigenous peoples, not only in our staff, but the connections that we make, whether it's through Chihutka, you know, Northeast Russia, to the uh, Inuits across Northern Alaska, through Northern Canada, to, to Sami people in, you know, from, from Greenland to, to Norway, to, even to, to Finland. And so cooperative efforts or, or allow us to, to weave in that indigenous perspectives in, in all my coursework. So every course that I have, there's a specific module that, that provides an opportunity for an indigenous people's perspective. So how does that influence local rules, uh, community rules, state rules, national rules, uh, and, and how are those, uh, how do those perhaps influence, you know, a positional power that they have or, or not? I mean, the, you know, indigenous peoples have been permanent participants for Arctic Council, you know, since its inception, but they don't get a vote. So, so that, so we're, we're trying to help influence while well, they're there. Well, let's get that voice heard. How do we make it more recognizable? And then, and that's also contributing to the other two pillars from a research perspective. Um, we have a number of projects that are looking at how does this, this human security aspect, this, this indigenous knowledge that's now thousands of years old, help influence or help validate, you know, today's science, if you will. And, and so it's interesting. Uh, I've seen science folks come from the lower 48 in the U.S. to an indigenous community uh, without seeking permission, without talking to them. And after three years worth of research, they'll try to produce a paper. And, and yet they could have gone and probably got the same information from, 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 a, lo from, a, from a local elder uh, in, in about an hour's conversation because they've been watching it, you know, since, since before, before time began. And so, so that that's helps feed that information not only to the community itself, but also gives them recognition for, for that intellectual knowledge that they already have. And then from an engagement perspective, um, from activities from an indigenous people's panel here at Arctic Circle Assemble, Assembly to we're doing a uh, uh, indigenous peoples focused on gender equality. Uh, one of my professors is actually traveling to Mongolia here later this spring to present that, that picture from an indigenous perspective uh, on what that looks like to try to survive and thrive in the Arctic. And, and for them, it's interesting. I mean, I'll talk about the harsh environment and, and they call it home. Um, so to providing that venue, providing that speaking opportunity is, is, is a, one of our main pillars to, to try to, to weave that across all uh, the perspectives. And, and, and I won't throw the U.S. government under the bus, but our relationship with, with some of those indigenous populations has not been all that rosy in the past. I mean, we could talk about colonialism and what that looks like across the world, but now providing an opportunity for their voices to be heard, for them to be able to speak out. That, that's part of our mission. And heck, we might actually learn a thing or two from them. And, and vice versa. So thanks, uh, great, great, great question. Yeah, okay. Um, well, this is a kind of a follow-up question, you could okay. say. So thank you, Matthew, for a very informative um, presentation. First, I was very glad to hear that Ted Stevens Center uh, includes human security in their concerns. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting to hear how strong a relationship you seem to have developed with indigenous communities. Now, given the somewhat still muted activity of the Arctic Council, uh, Njord mentioned that there are some projects that have started again, and this is true, but my understanding is that there is still very limited um, cooperation with Russian scientists, which means that we're missing data from half of the region. Correct. Now, given your relationship also with uh, indigenous communities and your knowledge of the dynamics of the region and the climate change, et cetera, could you share insight on the impact that the Arctic Council pause in activities has had on local and indigenous communities, uh, including perhaps in Siberia or Russia? 
Yeah, so, so it's a good, so that's, it's a very good question. And, and up front, the impacts to Siberia, to Northeast Russia, I, it's, that's not my expertise. I, I have some staff members that I could, if, if I brought them with, I could point them out and they could, they could help that. So, some of them are connected by, by family linkages, family connections, and, and so they, they talk daily. Um, but, but from a scientific aspect, you know, the position of the U.S. government was, hey, we're, we're not going to do that right now. I think we're seeing some movement change. Um, so to put Arctic Council on a pause, uh, pause maybe is not even the best word, stop. I mean, it, all work stopped. Okay, maybe there was some, some uh, you know, activity, some research that was still going on, but at the ministerial level, it was not occurring. As, as one of the most, I'll call it, uh, well-known and probably successful governance bodies, Arctic Council was very, very effective, especially bringing out, you know, the influence of, of climate change on the region, the influence on the peoples. I think that was incredibly valuable. Well, well that all stopped, you know, two years ago, and now we're not doing that. Some of that's coming back, but again, no, no full cooperative ministerial work is going. So some of those efforts that the products that are coming out of that research or the products that's coming out of that cooperation is not is not not floating up. So would we see a new agreement on on prevention of oil spills, you know, following up on the uh, IMO polar code on, on what are we going to do with, you know, double hull tankers that are operating in the space that 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 ministerial level, those outputs aren't going to happen anytime soon. And you could probably confirm that with with the recent chairship has has modified and changed. Uh, they're going to try to get there. But still, it requires Russia to participate. We, we may be able to get there in the future, but that's going to be up to Russia with their actions, with their actions in Ukraine. Um, I think one of the, the downfalls, especially from a, an indigenous people's perspective with Arctic Council uh, taking a pause, is most of the, in, the indigenous peoples were permanent participants. So they were at those conversations. They were involved in that research. They were involved in the development of those, po those policy pieces. Um, when it came to having a vote, they, they, they didn't have one, as I said, but at least their voices could be heard. They could offer up a position. That has stopped. So there's no, there's no unique formal uh, uh, venue or arena for the, for the indigenous peoples to have that, that voice right now. I mean, there's still international cooperation through ICC, you know, Inu Inuit Circle Polar Council and the like. That they still have a voice, um, but but doesn't really influence that governance structure as as Arctic Council was was connected to in the past. Does that make does that make sense? Thanks. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, I have a few questions from the participants online. Great. Uh, from Sanet, the question is: In the coming decades, do you view the feasibility of implementing environmentally sustainable practices in military operations within the Arctic as realistic? So it's realistic. So yeah. I guess we could define realistic, but I would say yes. Uh, and so it, it's interesting. So my line of work, so I'm a chemist by, by education, right? And, and so I find it very interesting, and I'm going to use two extremes. Um, so you'll have an environmental activist on this one, on one side, that wants to reduce carbon emissions, right? Reduce that, that carbon footprint across the world, especially in the Arctic, because it's so impactful there. Um, and yet we'll look at the, the military as the largest dinosaur killing entity in the world. Uh, rightfully so, I, I understand that connection. So they won't talk to them because they're, they're the bad folks. And then you'll have folks on the military side of the house that are, that are by, by congressional mandate, have to improve their energy efficiency. It, it, it's a budget mechanics. The, 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 the availability of, of those fossil fuels, if you will, are, are, are going to be diminishing, are going to reduce. And if, and if you're going to improve your asset resiliency, your capabilities, you're going to have to innovate and find other alternative sources. Um, so the Defense Department is doing that. They're, they're looking as, uh, from one extreme to, you know, looking from synthetic aviation fuels to small micro, you know, nuclear reactors. And what does that look like from an expeditionary standpoint? You know, on one side of the argument, Defense Department is doing that work, but they'll look at the environmental activists and go, oh, we can't, we can't talk there because we're, we're approaching it from two different norms. The Ted Stevens Center is trying to get those, those entities to sit around the table to have that same conversation because we're all in the same pursuits, right? It, it, it's about countering the action of, of climate change, reducing that impacts on the world at large. I, I think we're going to come at it from a different perspective, but the end results, we're looking to do the same. Uh, you could talk about, you know, an SMMR or an, or an MMR, on one side, and, and, and the environmental side is, oh, we can't do that because that, that's really bad. Okay, and yes, I've seen, you know, reports from Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, Fukushima, and, and yes, some parts of that nuclear energy are, 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 are hazardous, 
but you can look at the, the confines of France and how productive and how successful, how safely those programs have run, yet that doesn't enter the narrative between the, the two sides. So how do you have that diverse approach to a very complex problem and getting those folks to sit around the table? That's, that's, what, our, that's what the center is trying to do uh, across the board, to have those conversations. I'd say like-minded, the end results is where we're trying to get to. Our methodology for getting there may be just a little bit, a little bit different. Our job is to try to sync those and, and allow those, those voices to come together, have that conversation. Yeah, thanks. Then I have one more question from the, the chat as well. So we discussed a lot about the Arctic, obviously, but uh, what about non-Arctic countries like Portugal, for example, considering progressive and growing traffic uh, in the Arctic, North Atlantic, is maritime security at risk, a risk that applies to NATO? Yes, so, so, that, so that's a really good question. And so uh, because, because the way our center was founded, it, it, it's on Ar Arctic nations. I mean, that's our primary outreach is, is to, the, to the Arctic nations themselves. But at the same time, that outreach goes to allies and partners because, as they say, what happens to the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. So whether that affects the world, you know, cooling mechanism from that or the, the, the effects that it has on, on the protein, the, the, the fish stocks that are migrating north, to what that looks to do for you know, underwater movement of cold water streams and what that looks like for, for uh, ocean acidification and the like, all of that is gonna influence you know, the, the rest of the world. I mean, look at the mid-latitudes. Their largest concern stems from the Arctic when you look at global sea rise on, on what happens down the road. Well, those conversations need to happen across the board. Um, and it, but it's one thing to, to come to to come to Iceland to talk about the Arctic because it's 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 right there, right? Did I get the direction right? That's pretty close. But so it's right there. But but if you go to Central Europe, if if you go to to Italy or, or northern part of Africa, when they when you talk about Arctic, they're like, yeah, that that's that's a that's a long way away. But it has a direct impact on their livelihood today. And so involving them in that conversation, will will actually be in Garmisch, Germany in May to have a dialogue on, on Arctic security. But we're going to do an introduction to, to the topography, the geography, the, the peoples, the governance structure in the Arctic to 68 countries that, that aren't even near the Arctic. So in getting them to be Arctic aware, to have understanding of what the impacts of that environment do uh, to the region. That helps NATO's perspective, um, understanding the impacts of the changes ongoing in the Arctic climate perspective, but also the relationship that NATO has, you know, with its, you know, with its border, you know, Russia, for instance, on what does that, that environment look like from a stability perspective? How does that influence, you know, EU security? How does that in, uh, impact NATO security? Uh, all that needs to be communicated. So everybody starts with a, a fresh understanding of how do we define this space of the Arctic? And when you look at the increasing activity that's moving north and south, you know, the world is connected via the Maritimes. And, and so when you first talk about the impacts that, that drought conditions have taken on, on the Suez Canal, drought conditions have taken on the Panama Canal, now, now it's quick, you'll see the headlines, oh, it's gonna be across the top of the world. Eh, probably not today, probably not next week, probably not for a few years because of the ice conditions that are gonna be there. Um, well, well, that's a very dynamic environment. If we are gonna operate in, in that space um, and continue to increase that, that level of traffic, that goes back to the very first question on, well, what's, what's the, the presence, whether that's search and rescue, regulatory, uh, uh, response assets that are gonna have to govern that, that space as that activity continues to increase. You increase the activity, increases the competition, well, it increases the rub, the friction, whether it's you know, uh, company against company or nation against nation, well, having the right assets in there will keep that minimized to the, to the best of its ability. And I think that's where NATO comes in into that role. The, the challenge for NATO will be Large enterprise, 31, right? 32 countries. Um, and, and that's for this entire uh, defense of, of Europe, if you will, versus this, this micro focus on, on, a, on a small region, the Arctic. Important to me, as, as that's living near there, um, but from, the, from a NATO perspective, that's only a small piece of the entire, the entire piece, uh, entire pledge, if you will. Um, so focusing that conversation across to everybody, so the understanding what those dynamics are that are occurring up north, that those high latitude influences, how does that influence the mid-latitude sections is part of that communications that NATO is working on charge now. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. A uh, round of applause for Matthew. So, thank you. Yes. Thanks, thanks. Thank you so much for the, the lecture. Thank you. Appreciate it.